How's it going, T? Good. What piece do you have at the Herberger? Backpack. What piece do you have at the Herberger? Oh yeah, I mean that one. W that was the one that was at at the cultural center last year or, or spring. Or I can't remember where it was, but it's yeah. somewhere. The cultural, like the Louvre. Oh, at the uh, the Nile. It's been at a couple of places. I can't. Backpack. What piece do you have at the Herbert? Hello. Oh yeah, I mean that one. W that was the one that was at at the cultural center last year or, or spring. I can't remember where it was, but it's yeah. somewhere. Oh, at the uh, the Nile. It's been at a couple of places. What piece do you have at the Herbert? Is it just because this is? Hello. Oh yeah, I mean that one. W that was the one that was at. Okay, yeah, at the yeah. cultural center yeah. last year or, or spring. Cool. Okay, so I'm on my computer this morning. You won't see me down there, but hopefully the school computer gets fixed sometimes. The let's look at a something in Photoshop while I'm downloading all the stuff. Uh, th so there is a clone stamp in Sampler. But it's not really as uh, intuitive or fully featured as um, was in Photoshop. You know, it's just been a tool in Photoshop for for a long time. Um, and so let's look here. This comes into play with the tiling. The auto tile, or what is it? What is it called? It's called make it tile, and the, and the tiling and sampler are pretty good. But they're not going to work in absolutely every instance, and I saw a lot of that in the brick, the brick uh, example that came through for a bunch of these. And so there's, you know, some instances in which you're just going to need to tile it yourself. Let's look at how that would happen. So that you feed before you even bring before you uh, bring it into sampler, you just take the source image and make it tileable. Um, so I'll use this one first. And so this is a bunch of pictures I took. This one's slightly different. I don't think we did this one last week. Um, slightly bigger rocks to bring in and work with. but. We're going to use a square crop. You can feed Sampler a non-square image. You're just going to need to undistort it with the tiling, either when you use it or later on. Um, but in general, if you can feed Sampler a square image, that's better. OK, cool. So the photo merge here broke. 
I don't know what's going on with this. Let's see. Yeah, for some reason it thinks there's stuff way over there. But we're going to crop it anyway. So. So if you want to make sure you have a square crop, if you just hold down shift, right, that's going to make sure that the area that you're using is perfectly square, which works in this instance. And so that gives us that. Cool. And then let's look at this one. So this, you know, is just the photo merge, right, uh, taking multiple pictures so that you have, you know, just more pixel content you're sending over there. Uh, what does this end up being? This cropped version. 3,000 pixels across. Um, and so, let me go ahead and start this. Making anything tileable by hand, right? The make a tile is handy. When does make a tile work better? It seems to work better with non things that don't have like a discernible pattern to them, right? Like these rocks or any sort of organic sort of pattern. The make a tile seems to work just fine. Um, but for other things, it doesn't quite work. And that was apparent in some of the brick examples. So if you have to do this by hand, in any instance, it's really just two things. One, you have to offset the image um, so that you can see the, you essentially move the edges to the middle. And then uh, clone stamp to um, remove edges. Right, because it's going to be tileable if whatever pixels are over here are continued over here. Right, that's what makes it tileable. Right, that's what makes it so that we don't get a seam when it gets tiled on whatever surface. Um, and so, let's flatten this first. And then we will go to, it's under other offsets. There's no filter search in Photoshop, is there? No, weird. There probably is, I just don't know about it. Um, anyway, so it's under filter, other offset. Right, so this is pretty simple. All you want to say that you do want a preview, and it just offsets the image. And so at zero, it's you know completely as it was. But when you do this, you see it starts offsetting it. The seam is now right there. Right. So if I move this. I can move the seam to the middle. If you move it to the, anywhere besides the edge is good, but the middle gives you the most room to work to cover this up. Right? And you do the same thing in both directions because we would want it to tile this way and this way. And so here, again, I move it this way. Turn off the grid. There we go. Now we can see it a little clearer. All right, so this is super simple filter, right? Just offsets it, and so now it's been offset. So now this is tileable. We'll still see the seam, but now the seam, instead of being on the edge of the image, is like we've offset it so that now it's in the middle. This makes it much easier to use the clone stamp tool to essentially cover up. Uh, the line that's going to be 
right here and right here and so you just say okay and now it's offset and so now you can come into quorum stamp and essentially cover this up by repeating stuff that's not from that section right so again you hold down alt to select you know where am I going to copy from and then just click and drag to where I'm going to copy to a pattern like this I'm going to make this about the size of a rock or so we'll see how this goes So we just want to do something here to sort of cover up the, the line, um, all the lines, this way and this way. So for instance, do something like that. Uh, in order to make it not, you know, if you cover it up so that the line isn't there, that's good. But you do want to make sure that, um, you know, in this case, if you have a rock there, you kind of want the full rock. Um, and, you know, picking something from a different part of the image is going to make it seem less, um, right, so this line here, that's pretty good. Now let's grab this one here. Now, when you're doing this, you don't want to run it right up to the edge, right? Because these, these pixels, since we've offset it, these pixels now wrap around seamlessly. And the other thing to be aware of when you're clone stamping is you don't want to run into the edge of the image, which happened here, right? I essentially clone stamped a straight line in there, which is counterproductive for what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, so I'll undo that one. And let's grab something from here. Cool, that line's pretty well covered up. Now, maybe over here. working probably a little bit more about there okay all right so see how the straight lines are disappearing right that one's gone that one's kind of gone that one rock looks a little weird but it's fine um let's grab let's get this one so over here so here here's an example of what i'm talking about right i picked this spot right but uh this is the source and i started pasting it here right or stamping it rather but as I move in this direction, um, I'm essentially copying this. And so at some point, I run out of stuff, right? And so that means that um, if I were to start this here, start going in this direction, I get this straight line because I, run up, I ran up against the edge of the image, right? Um, and so I have to probably stop before I get to that point. and pick some other location. Okay, so now I don't have any straight lines, right? This, you know, essentially two steps. Again, one, offset the pattern or offset the image so that, you know, the seams in the middle. And then two, clone stamp 
over the seams. Now, right uh, when I bring this in, I'm not going to put the um, make a tile on this, right? Because I just did that part by hand here, right? So we'll export this as a PNG. Now, let's do this again with the other one. Because this is the one I gave you guys to all do. And you guys, a bunch of people did use the make a tile on there, but the make a tile just really didn't give um, satisfactory results. And that, you know, like the bricks were clearly cut up, like the brick pattern was not um, continuous. So let's look at that one. With these little sprigs of grass in these, you know, I mean, it's kind of stamped down. I mean, I don't know if it's the end of the world to have a little bit of that there. Um, it's just important to realize that you're never going to get the grass to, like, grow out of the material. It's not really going to happen given current technology. Uh, cool. Let's straighten this out. Well, let's flatten it first. magic right so just the automatic button at least gives us straight lines which is important in this case because we want to um, do that square crop right so um, doing the square crop is going to be a lot easier if this line is straight across the image versus as if it's you know kind of like at an angle like that so we're good that's good and now we can uh, crop this So in this case, if we grab this here, um, we're going to give ourselves a little bit more room. Again, we're going to hold down Shift to get a square. Whoa. Now, I'm going to go inside that. I think it's going to be more beneficial. Let's do this. OK. Because again, this is photo merge. So there's plenty of pixels there. We should be pretty good. So we'll crop it down to that. Cool. OK, that's good. Now, um, like I said, this is one that would not fare that well. The other one we just did as the first example, right? That, might want, that one might work in make a tile because it's not like a pretty obvious visual repeating pattern. But here we've got, you know, like not exactly repeating, but you know, the bricks should be bricks, right? When you just fed it into make a tile with no settings, it would like cut up some of the bricks and just obviously not look like bricks. Um, so in this case, uh, you know, make a tile is not, you know, artificially intelligent or something. It doesn't know that it's bricks. It's just doing this pretty simple, it's doing exactly what we just did by hand. It's just, um, you know, sort of doing it with like an automatic um, kind of, instead of clone stamping, it's kind of using like a quick select kind of thing to grab the parts that cover up the lines. So let's do the same thing. Filter, other, offset. All right, so again, 
just moving it so that it's towards the middle of the image. It just makes sense, you know, putting the X in the middle just gives you more room to work, right? If the, if the seams are right up against uh, the edge, it's just tougher to work that way. Uh, okay, cool. And so now, you know, it's a little bit more of a puzzle to cover up some of these seams, but we'll see what we can do. All right, so here, we want this covered up. And in this case, um, for the bricks, right, if we want this to be covered up by here, we kind of need to think about in terms of the bricks, how to cover things up. And so if we want this to be a straight line that goes up and covers up that line, um, I'm gonna pick one that already has that in place that maybe isn't, rather than picking it right here and copying it there, you pick it from a place that's further apart, further away in the texture, you know, it gives you less of the obvious repeatability. So I'll alt click right there on that corner and then sort of do that, right? And then, there we go, that sort of heals that up there. Uh, here, if I come from this, should be sure to be able to fill out the middle of the brick, but I gotta be careful I don't hit the other part there. Right, that's what we want to avoid, is this kind of thing, where now we get, you know, that, where it's not, not right. And so you don't have to click and drag every time, you can just sort of grab one and click, just sort of you know, spot paint it in. Um, here, that's not gonna work because it's got this thing going over that way. Let's, here. Maybe if I do it over this way, right about there. And then here, and we've got to get to these lines, right? So it's definitely more work when you're trying to cover this up here with this kind of pattern and keep it consistent. But, you know, it's like a, a bigger pattern. Let's make this larger.
All right, so I'm just sort of creating my own bricks there in the middle. The middle one's definitely, I mean, it's a little puzzle game, Tetris-ish here in terms of trying to make it work, right? It's a lot more demanding when it's a discernible pattern like this than it was in the rock one because, you know, it's just way more forgiving. It's like a bunch of random rocks. So, like, if one rock doesn't look quite right, you know, probably not going to see it. But we've got this really high contrast situation with bricks, Everybody knows that bricks are, you know, somewhat equidistant and um, should look relatively consistent. So I'm pretty close. I mean, that's a weird brick, but I don't know if that's terrible. I mean, I'm not a mason, but I imagine things like that happen sometimes. I've seen those shows where they try to retile their bathroom. It doesn't go that well. Cool. Okay, well that's way better than what we had. Right, and now I'm sure this is gonna repeat I don't like that one over there quite as much. I kind of like that. I don't want to go too far because I don't want to clone stamp over the edge, right? Because that's going to ruin the work I did with the tiling itself. So. Good. All right, we'll call it. Um, and again, we'll export this as a PNG. Does the concept make sense? So that you don't have a hard edge, you have a, an irregular tile, and that way there isn't really a quadratic kind of thing. So you have transparent gaps intentionally. And when I brought it into Substance Sampler, I was using the um, what's it called? What's it called? Where the I can't remember the function. Where you, where you um, ease the, you can't remember the slider, the slider thing. Where you ease the. The one that you edge, you move the edge over, up or up, I, I don't know what it is. Ah, you understand my point. It is to intentionally make an irregular edge, a jigsaw. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's what the make a tile is doing. It's it's just sort of finding yeah, I didn't that. Yeah, I do make a tile because I couldn't find it. Oh, okay. I couldn't find where it was. I had a lot of trouble finding things. I have the right version. So a lot of stuff. I, I just have. I, that's just one of my problems all the time. It's like move back on the on the. So it should be up. On the live stream, I just can't see what you did. Up here, the all the all the functions are up here on the upper right. Yeah. If you just. You can, and they're searchable, which is great. Because there's make a tile, and then there's just. Yeah, make a tile is and then down below, a little smarter. That's just in the preview. All, all that's oh, doing is just how, yeah, like, 
just how many times are we repeating it on the shape. Doesn't that what all the settings down here? These are all just viewer settings. Okay, just how we're looking at it on that sample geometry. Threshold. Uh -huh. You cut a track, but you can hover over the edge and you still get the track. There's still the track that's still under there. Uh huh. It's kind of like that. You can scroll the transform to, to start to see more of the edge come back. Yeah. But it doesn't. But it it, will, it works only in the kind of like jigsaw thing. Yeah, I mean, um, using some other technique like that, um, like for here. The, the thing that's going to make it tileable is just making these lines go away, right? Yeah. So the clone stamp does that. But, I mean, you could also cover stuff up other ways if, if you could get it to work. I use the, the J content aware all the time. I just grab some ones that have these similar tones with similar value. Just make another row. All right, so let's see if that covers up this line and how that does. Well, in this case, yeah, yeah, well, that would be my first go-to. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the same kind of thing that was happening in um, so what I, what with I Make It Tough. So what I would do is, like this, maybe, you know, one of my things is, is I would go to content, the manual content aware J. So I'm going to select and extend instead of move. Not, not take that. I would deselect that and I would take the ones that I want to grab and stamp them on top of it. Like J, the J. Just J? Yeah. Yeah. That's all I need. Yeah. So it's the spot yeah. spot healing? Yeah. Where is it? I'm missing it here. So just that's J. The, that's the colored icon, the drop down the drop down there. Yeah. Things like that. Oh, that's. I think you're in. You were in move. You have to be in extend. Up on the the top menu. Yeah, extend. Okay. Yeah. You gotta hit enter. Is there a shortcut for deselect? Yeah, control D. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's gonna work too. That'll be yeah. You know, as long as as long as the seam is gone, 
that's the you know important part and don't touch the stuff at the edge because that's after you run the offset then you know it's perfectly repeatable that it'll the edges will repeat uh, seamlessly The, the tiling's done. Like, I'm not going to run any tile stuff in in sampler at all. Like, that's that's the step we're doing here. Let me export this one, too. And so now, if I come back here. Yeah, so I don't need to do, you know, I don't need, I don't need tile or make a tile. Could probably do a little bit better job in some of the areas, but, you know, that's, we're essentially doing that part by hand then at that point. And then, um, yeah, we can make our other changes from there, but, you know, probably switch the base material to brick. Same thing with the other one. Let's bring that one in too. So the Right, and then again, this this tiling over here, this is just, you know, for um, how much is it going to be repeated in the preview geometry that we're looking at here, right? That's all that's going on here, right? So you can make it more dense, or that's just offset rather, um, the tiling here. So the offset just moves it. We don't need to offset it. No, none, none of the stuff down here, n the light, the shape, n none of this matter, none of this is captured in the SBSAR. It's just for you looking at it while you're doing your work, right? Because the SBSAR doesn't, it's not a smart material, right, uh, coming out of here. Because, you know, again, smart materials depend on the bake, you know, knowing about the geometry, and that doesn't happen here. That, in substance paper. You can, these materials, you could use them in, you know, like a smart material that you then make over in Painter, but by default, they're not going to know about um, the geometry of the object because it's, it's just the 
essentially all we're doing here is spitting out the textures, right? I mean, that's the, the SBS AR file is just um, a wrapper around, you know, whatever it is, four or five different textures. Instead of having to bring in diffuse and height and uh, normal, it's just all of those textures just kind of packaged into one thing versus having to manage all the textures um, by itself. All right, so the we get the line reappearing if this if the tiling over here is not a whole number because then you know we're not doing a full repeat there but if it were a whole number it should be fine right now here when you make it small then if you make it too small you can clearly see that like okay yeah I get this repeating here right but that's that's how it is like that's just the way the thing works right so the the there's only so much you know room for these things um, depending on how they're you know repeated within the within the geometry that you have there but everyone yeah I mean that's if well, for whatever reason make a tile isn't working and uh, the tile is not working then you know just going in and offsetting and then somehow covering that up either with the copy and extend or the clone stamp or anything it just moves the lines to the middle so that then you can properly cover them up and you get some sort of repeatable texture right that job is like definitely more tricky when we have something that has like an obvious pattern to it but that job is you know a lot easier when it's something that looks more stochastic where you know you could get away with more in terms of covering up the lines that makes it easier so I'll have everybody do the brick one again because there's a bunch that came in here I think it was Max's that caught my eye at first let me see if I can find all of the downloads here Um, not necessarily. The UV wrapping comes into play here, right? So whether or not the UVs, it works, it's clear, it's easy. This is why most of the time you're using either the sphere or the cube or something. If you want to look at it the, on the other stuff, that's fine. But, you know, the UV wrapping comes into play here as far as like the, in the cube, like the default UV wrapping is to just take the whole square and have it fill the entire texture space. But as you know, like any other shape, then you got to start to divide that up somehow. So, yeah, then then you run into that situation, right? But I I wouldn't even, you know, if you if you're fairly confident with the Photoshop, and then, you know, it looks pretty good on the sphere and the cube because you know those wrap around, then you would be okay because you could further cover up the seams if you wanted it to wrap around something using the triplanar mapping in Painter or in Cinema 4D. And you know, every program does triplanar mapping. So, right, where they project it and, you know, blur the edges to cover up the seams. Sampler doesn't have any other projections. The like sampler doesn't care about geometry. Like it's not that, that's not, the, it's not what the tool is for. It's just for making the textures, right? So like, like that's why there's no triplanar mapping in it because it, it's not, if you know, once you care about that, how it lays onto your geometry, you're not in sampler anymore, right? Sampler is just for essentially just acquiring, you know, this process of taking stuff and scanning it in and turning it into a 
to a material, right? Once you start talking about how it lays across a specific piece of geometry, not this tool. It's going to be Painter, or you know, you can do most of those things in Cinema to some extent. You know, any the program that's actually going to be presenting the final asset, right? Sampler doesn't render anything. It doesn't, you know, th like it's not. All it's doing is making SPSAR files that then you can send to, you know, literally anything else. So there's a, that's the nice thing about Substance. The Substance, you know, workflow or whatever um, suite is that, you know, it has been around for a while. So now it's been, you know, there it's integrated into most everything. Like there's a Unity Substance plugin. There's an Unreal Substance plugin. We, you know, we've done that last semester. We drug you can drag the substances right into Cinema 4D. So it's um, there is like a second um, open material um, format that's you know ideally it's an open source format that. In a perfect world, everybody would use that, and then it would work everywhere. But you know, it's just business at this point. You know, like the substance is not an open format; it's proprietary, right? It's owned by Adobe now at this point, so it's obviously in their best interest that everyone license their thing in order to, um, you know, run it on their programs because everyone uses it. So, um, you know, there's a bunch of of uh, 3D formats like this. Because there's, I mean, in every piece of, so in every text instance, there's this, like, why don't we all just use open source free stuff? Like, yeah, that would be great. For whatever reason, we don't, you know, because a lot of times its development is not as um, fully featured. You know, there's many reasons, but that that's one. And then it's not, uh, people running a business don't really have a lot of, you know, if your idea is to make money, then you know, using all the open formats, you know, a lot of this stuff ends up being licensing, where it's like, oh, we, like, I'm pretty sure, like, FBX is like what we use to send things back and forth, but that's not a free format. The free format is OBJ. OBJ is open or object something. I, I believe OBJ is is the open source format, but. You know, FBX usually works more consistently, but that's an Autodesk. And I believe if you use FBX in your program, then you need to license that from Autodesk, right? So everyone's just trying to get a piece of the action um, on all this stuff. So I think so. I haven't done that there, but I would almost be certain. I think it does. I mean, if not, like Blender is more like Unity, where there's like a gazillion add-ons. Like I'm sure there's a Substance Blender add-on, but um, I'll have to look. Did you have a chance to try those lace files again? The which? The ones from the lace example? No. no they're they're said JPEGs. Said to update, make sure my computer is updated. At that point, I didn't have time. But what, uh, uh, when, yeah, at the end here, let's try that again. Yeah, I mean, because there's I nothing. I really wanted to do that one. It's so bad, bad and the denim. And the it didn't seem like there's anything weird about those files, oh. but I don't know. Where's Max here? Max, I'll pick on you because. The other stuff is going great. Uh, where's the snapshots here? Um, yeah, right. So um, here, like the, you can see, you know, we get this happening here, right? The, with the, right, this little guy, his name is Matt. Um, 
the you know this is continuously UV unwrapped across the face of matte there but you can see that that doesn't work quite well in this instance right so going back in and you know doing that by hand right that would be um, the better way in that instance to sort of get get the results that you want let's look at everybody's stuff real quick um, ba -ba -ba. All right, yeah, so Max is brick. We saw that. Or wait, can I just do this? Nope. Floor tile. This is one that Max brought in. The, um, oh, my default here, let's see, Marvel, right, so this was from the examples, I believe. The mulch. Yeah, that looks good. I mean, the leaves seem like, you know, the atlas is cool, but, you know, if you, re if you repeat it too much, then I think it kind of gives it away. Um, but that works. The, you know, the, the cool thing about substance is it does have this, I mean, we all know that like displacement is a heavy operation now, right? Because you're actually displacing the polygons. And, you know, this view here has that super fast GPU displacement. Um, so in this, I mean, would this texture, would we use displacement on this texture? Maybe, you know, depending on depending on the render, right? If this were like, the larger it would be in the scene, the less likely I would be to use displacement on it. Um, but if it were like at the bottom of like a um, fish tank or something like that, and we actually wanted to see the pebbles up and down, you know, then you can adjust these settings here, you know, with the amount of displacement and you can just dial it in, right? Like this is really nice. And then the displacement quality this, what is this doing? T, what do you think? What's this, what's this actually doing to the geometry? Are we getting more polygons or less? Like over here, do you think we have more polygons on this one? Yeah, this is essentially um, subdivisions here, right? Uh, yeah, I can't get my button. Subdivisions. Because um, if we move it the whole way down, it's still being displaced, but you know, it comes back to our you know one fundamental principle single poly cannot be bent, right? And so in order to create more curvature and detail on the surface, you need to subdivide the thing. Now, displacement subdivision is different than throwing it in a subdivision surface, right? Because it it's a ton of subdivision, and even in like the Cinema 4D standard renderer, it, you don't see it by default in the viewport, right? Because um, they, since people started displacing things, it makes sense to offset that calculation until render time. But here, now y we can do displacement like on the GPU, and so it becomes this like interactive, you know, easy to dial in kind of thing, right? But again, a little bit goes a long way here, right? Like, like this would probably be the maximum. Once you start doing this kind of stuff, it just looks like everyone who does this work knows exactly it just looks weird and like you're not fooling anyone here. <laughs> you're, not, you're not turning it into mountains, right? Because again, um, it's still the same amount of pixels, but they're just now being wrapped around like a much larger area, right? So, I mean, um, you, there's only so 
so far you can push this idea. Um, you know, something like that is going to be way more interesting. Remember the um, shift right mouse button rotates the light, you know, so you can really see how that works versus if it were not displaced at all. But we're still getting a little bit of shadowing and movement, right? But that's all coming from the uh, normal map. Uh -huh. Where, where, what happens to the thing where I, which you can add displacement if you want to? Because some places even at the bottom, and some some say, oh, like there it's a normal, over yeah, you know, so it's a normal, and um, yeah, like how do you bring in those channels if you want them? Um, if you bring in your image, the displacement comes from the height channel, and it makes a height channel automatically. Yeah, yeah, this, okay. this, this thing here yeah. does a lot. So, like, essentially it's taking your one picture and generating this right. and this and this. But, but you can't, like, where are the sliders? That's In here. Right, so uh, this is a pretty deep one. Right. There's a bunch here and... Um, yeah, and uh, if you, a bunch of these, for whatever reason in Sampler, they decided to divide them into basic parameters, and then there's usually something at the bottom that says advanced or more, and if you uncarrot, or if you scroll down there, then there's more stuff that's available. Um, but that's um, all the decisions that were made to turn it into a thing are happening happening there with that. And Max's painted wall looks good. Plaster. The quilted leather from the examples. And the window curtain. I wanna <laughs> Anytime I see this now, I try to alt drag on the window. Um, cool, that's interesting. Kind of looks like a shower curtain a little bit. Cool. We'll gra we'll drag the other ones into. Well, I'll put them in a folder so that we can all check them out. Here's Celeste. So she did the lace pattern. That's from the. You know, materials and minutes. Those are pretty dense, but we got those in there. That's the wall example I gave. And so Celeste used the color variation, right? Which again makes it a little bit more interesting in that now you got kind of gives you that crappy paint job sort of look, right? Where like it didn't completely the green didn't completely cover up the yellow from before, which you know totally usable you know in an instance where you're trying to show something that's not super fit and finish is this I can't remember is this one from the minutes I don't remember I think so Wait, how did she the color variation like I just keep losing those <laughs> there ev every layer filter thing is is here. So right here, you know, color. Oh, I just spelled it wrong. Okay. Color. Yeah, there it is. Color variation. So yeah, you can, they're all listed. I know there was a list somewhere. Yeah, they're all listed down here, but I, I, you know, in the last couple weeks using this, I haven't used this at all. I just come up here because it's like After Effects for me. I just search for the thing I want and then dump it in. Right, because it, it essentially works like the After Effects effects menu. Then at that point, just bring it in there. Do you not have this window there? Well, yeah. This 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 is they're all here, so you can scroll down. If you don't type in anything, you can see all of your options, 
and pick one. Or you can you know, type in something and then pull up the one that you want. I didn't even click that because I thought it was like Photoshop and had a layer in the blank layer. Okay. Yeah, uh, I don't think you can make a quote unquote blank layer. I mean, you can make you can bring in multiple images, but you can't. Um, yeah, I mean they're more like adjustment layers, right? Because they're all effects, right? As far as the Photoshop analogy goes, there, right? They're using the word layer, but they're all, you know, mostly transformative. Some of them are slightly generative, you know, like Atlas Scatter, like we used, right? Like that's not. It's like doing a new thing on top of the other stuff. Um, pavement. That's cool. That looks good. That's cool. That's definitely usable. Like uh, Phoenix stucco outside of wall. That looks pretty good. I think you got that one fairly well tiled there. Street. That looks good. And then the yard mulch. Yeah, the thing with the yard mulch. Um, There was one over here with um, a hue. And so what I think it's doing here is it's you know making a random array of points on the surface and then um, cloning the leaf at each of those points. And then it looks at like the underlying texture and says like what is the what is the color value at this point in the texture and I'll make the leaf that color, right? Um, but for something like the mulch here, um, yeah, some of the, you know, small pixel colors ended up with these like really saturated leaves, which um, I believe there's a hue and saturation scale um, slider here in the scatter, which would, you know, chill out some of these that would look a little, you know, just too, too green in that instance. Cool, those all look really good. Cool, all right, so what, okay, you took a picture of? Oh, okay. Okay, so it's just the cans. So, did you want to use this more of like an abstract kind of thing, or you want to make it look like cans? No, abstract. But okay, it's okay. More abstract, and I, when I threw it on a T-shirt, I did that because I wanted to ask. Like, I can't seem to rotate like you can in subsystem. I couldn't rotate that. I couldn't rotate that. I think there's a. Let me look here. Uh, Yeah, texture rotation. Yeah, so right, right here. Would let you do that. 
that's what came to my mind. I was maybe nine, eight, and six and like you know, I get it's you know, like forty five degrees. My nine went where you would typically take that frame and grab one of the cover out of the corner and you would get that double arrow. You know, uh huh. So you just want the cans to, what, what are you trying to that achieve here? Okay, but like I wanted to try to make a smaller pattern that was based on, like this, like 45 degrees. So, yeah, I mean, just in, I mean, to, if you want to have total control over that, you would just open up that shirt in Painter and bring in the SVSAR file and do it there. If you just really want a quick, mock-up, right? Because in Painter, then you'll be able to have total control over the geometry and the thing. Like, again, this is just like a preview thing. Yeah. And so, yeah, it would be a matter of rotating here yeah. and then, you know, turning uh, this up or down. If you want more cans on there, you know, it would be some higher amount of oh. tiling. Right, that. Okay, that's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because every, you know, yeah, every program, right? We're we're just making the material, and then like, obviously, no matter w the programs that are making like output, Painter, Cinema 4D, Unity, whatever, like every instance of those materials, you're you're gonna have a tile slider there where you can make it get more dense or less dense. Like that's that's ubiquitous, right? So. Yeah, the, the amount of tiling is not burned into the material, right? The, you know, you essentially have one, your, whatever you're making is one tile, yeah. right? And then, and then do with it as you wish yeah, in the other. Oh, this is cool, this is cool. This turned out cool. And then did you, so did you use the make a tile on this or? No, I couldn't find it. I didn't use make a tile on anything. Okay. Photo merge didn't work very well, so you can see, you know, I flipped it, I did a mirror image, and then I used content aware and oh, okay. up the edge. So the 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 big thing with photo merge that I've noticed is that like I have to overlap the images more than you know yeah. I thought, right? Yeah. The more, which means you just have to take a lot more pictures. But yeah, like it, it if there's any, the more overlap, the more you can change the angle, and it seems to do a good job. Yeah. But like, I mean, how much? Less than fifty, like thirty or twenty, seems to be better for me. Like where, but even then, like some, like that one I just did, like it was weird. Like I thought there was something way over there, but. Um, yeah, yeah, this turned out cool. Oh, cool. Yeah, so this this yeah, this is like an awesome um, use case, right? Where you I mean now we know m enough about physics simulation that you know, could I make a mesh that's a bunch of crushed feel like yeah, I could, but now you know like it's going to be crazy heavy and like you know, for for what? You know, like um, it, so in this instance if you're doing a scene at a recycling plant or whatever it is, right? And you just need a bunch of crushed cans, this would be certainly the way to go. Yeah, I'm surprised about how, how good the displacement looks on the cans there. I, I haven't looked at displacement on that one. I don't know if that one's in there, there is displacement. But uh, yeah, I just, I don't know, I was surprised how it, it, it worked. But again, that's a case where I, I had six pictures overlapping a lot. And did, did photo merge work or not? Yeah, I, mm, I did definitely start with photo merge. And then, you know how you uh, the visibility, you change the visibility of the layer and you find that some of them really are AI, like they, you know, some pieces are missing. Yeah. So I would merge two layers that worked with two layers that worked and then I would drag one into another, like a transform. Okay. So I would eventually, eventually filled up all the bl blanks, any of the blanks that came with photo merge. Okay.
Cool. And then did you change the base material to metallic in this one? So the when you when you bring when there's you there's no base material. That one has no base material. There's no no base material. It does not have a base material. Yeah, I wanted to I tried it a couple ways. I just found it worked better without the I think it has to do with the, the displacement. With without displacement, I start to see too much base material. It's too white. Too much stuff coming through. So I Oh okay, okay. That's not what the base material is. It's not like a thing underneath yours. It's like um it's just sort of like the default uh, properties of the substance, right? So like, is it, you know, is it gonna be more metallic or is it gonna be, you know, it's essentially it's just a preset for like roughness and metallic sliders. Mm -hmm. Like it's not underneath the thing. Um, when I followed along, looking at the race one, even though I couldn't use it, uh -huh. they tell you don't bring, don't bring in the base material the one that's the lace part. Uh, so I don't know, I just didn't use mine on this. On the one of the ones coming up, I used the base material and then it was out. Yeah. So I mean the just adjusting the metallic value so it would be more there. But that's cool. That's a really good use case mm -hmm. for this. So the, the next three they're they're all based on a bunch of photos of the rust area of Lee Peak. So they're all the same set of photos, but I was just playing around with what parameters you can get out of substance based currently. Uh -huh. so I added the metal metallic. And then the next one I add, I didn't have any, but the next one's called raw. The this one, patina? You know, next to the. Oh, the oh, this one, okay. Yeah, that's just right, exactly right there with Lee Peak. Okay. No metallic. That one looks better than the other ones. <laughs> this one, you can see there's an installation picture next to it. That's a little flat. Yeah. So I took it right from the middle, and I had you know a lot of getting rid of the molding, getting rid of the door panel eventually got a bunch of images that I merged. Yeah, I mean this just trying to be kind of creative with what I can do here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I haven't done a lot of work on that. I mean so when you're doing this, I mean um Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the I, I was thinking a little bit about that over the weekend. I think maybe the um, Atlas thing would be more useful, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll come back. Let me let me look at everybody else's, and then we'll come back to this idea. But um, yeah, I was thinking about that. I mean, because the Atlas is you know sure put leaves on it, put rocks on it, right? You know, put more junk on top of the thing. But also, you know, thinking of it more like a cloner, you know, I think uh, something like this where you just take one of these shapes in, or maybe four or five of them in an atlas, and then you use the atlas splatter to, you know, create a substance that splatters those things on the surface. And then, you know, like for something like this, if you're going to do a lot of this kind of thing, like probably like this is an SPSAR, this is a separate one. And then, you know, on your car model, in Painter, you're putting them where you want. You know, would be the the way to go there. So that's the same set of photos from the two, the exact same set of photos. Oh, cool. And I just used corrode. There's a, there's an add add layer corrode. Yeah. And change and added a color adjustment color. Color variation. Uh huh. Yeah, that's cool. That's same photos. That's why I love doing this. Like, there's just so much of. It just takes 
How do you really feel about what is cheap? <laughs> How do you really feel about what is cheap? <laughs> <laughs> well, the name of it is sort of, that's, that's the name of it, it's a sort of attitude of like, riding around in these big gigantic antlers on top. Oh, wow. It's completely worthless, and I have to stand on a milk crate to get into it. <laughs> it's really, you really look like you've come out of the I didn't mean to, <laughs> to dig up a bunch of stuff here, but. It's that high up? It's that high up. Oh, wow, jeez. I have to hold the antler. <laughs> <laughs> so it's antler. more it's more of a handlebar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, going into the... But what somebody... The reason it's called Billy Gap, which you know what that acronym means. Do I look like I hear that? Uh, oh, okay. I didn't know that one. All right. Cool, more concrete. Whose are these? These are Fabio's. Gravel. Cool, yeah, so I mean like that amount of like shrubbery in there, especially if it's gonna be, you know, smaller, that probably works all right. I mean, when I was saying that about the grass, I really just wanted to emphasize that like, you're not gonna make grass grow out of the material. Like that's not gonna happen. Cool. What does he do? What does he do see when he has like the, the, the Suzuki F? What does he do see for the model on the to the right there for the TV? And what are those holes? Uh, it's the 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 mat in Painter has uh, several texture sets, and so I don't know. This is a UV unwrap of some part I think on the back there's an S or something oh. like for you know like the substance logo that's what that is oh. right so you're only looking when you're doing multiple texture sets you're only looking at the UV over here for one texture set at a time right oh, so oh uh, no it's the stand it's the stand oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah 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 that's what it is oh. right so this the, the stand has a separate texture set and then you know, I think there's each body part has a separate texture set so yeah, that's by default. You're just looking at the the uh, stand there. Cool. You kind of gave that like a shinier sort of look there. The works turned out pretty well. I mean, I can tell here we got a little bit of that stuff going on, and then here you get those like half faded lines, right? And yeah, you can see that you know it shows up there and over here, right? Which just kind of breaks up the illusion of brick. And the solar panel that was in the m materials and minutes, and another. S I, I expected to see a lot of stucco walls, and and we are. So yeah, this is good. And cool. Um, so the other thing Fabio did here is um, right. I kind of didn't emphasize this in my frustration with the computer not working last time. Right, this that guy right there. This is important, right? So this there's all these adjustments here that you're doing to the substance, but there's some things that you'd want to adjust somewhere else. And so this is publishing the parameter. So that means that when you drag it in, right, because we, we know this now, right? Like we downloaded some substances off a of substance source or whatever, and some of them have way more sliders than others, right? And that's because when the person made them in sampler or designer, that they you know, either made more of the parameters available or not, because there's a, there's a sweet spot there, right? You don't want to just 
publish every parameter because then you know you bring in your substance and there's like 70 sliders and it's like uh, uh, yeah you know. and so you want to keep it to the ones that actually make sense and so here um, with what Fabio is doing he published you know he used the uh, was a color variation and so he published both the color variation so that now when he's using this one in painter he can you know easily change the color variation on top of it here right now you know to be honest like there's also you know like the color gradient overlay in painter so you know that that one is not super critical like he could get away with other ways around it but there'd be other things that you know would be a good idea to to publish if you're going to use them over there cool that's good Here's Marvin's. Wait, does Marvin have two folders? Okay, yeah, w one from. What's that? And these are the screenshots. Cool. So some road here and in this case yeah I can tell you use the the make it tile did you use the make it tile yeah yeah you did and so like this one you know it is segmented like the bricks but it's not like a regular pattern and so the make it tile probably works a little better I mean you can it, now you know their eyes are trained you can sort of see it right here right where it's not you know like this would probably be continuous over that way but it works well enough in this sort of gravel uh, you know sort of road example there Cool, that's the bricks from the materials and minutes. And here's the plastic one, sort of like a um, seat belt. It's escaping me. What are seat belts made of? Um, Kevlar. Cool, that one works. Another brick pattern. The repeating on that is okay. Yeah, there's the mulch. Cool, you got the pattern there. Yeah, so here, same sort of issue where the make a tile doesn't really quite hold up with this one. Yeah, no wall with some texture there. Does work, Marvin. And Those are the other substances Marvin has. Oh, those are all from Marvin. Is that everybody? Marvin, Fabio, yeah. T, you're still working on this one? Okay.
Howdy, everyone. For this week, uh, did, just had a small uh, question. In a substance sampler for the for implementing a floor tile layer for the material, I was uh, wondering if you could change how the textures are tiled because by default, if you use multiple input textures into the floor tile layer, um, it displays them in a checkerboard pattern. And I was wondering if you could make that random instead of just a checkerboard pattern. But uh, I don't know, maybe that wouldn't be as useful or maybe it doesn't exist. I don't know. I just thought I'd ask. But um, that's all I have for this week. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's look here. All right, so let's come back. All right, so Max did the one floor tile as an example. Right, and that one, the floor tile, instead of taking a picture of a bunch of tiles, it's more along the lines of like you have a texture of some kind and you want to add tiles to that. So for instance, Let's grab something real quick. There, actually, do I have something from? Okay, cool. So I have something pretty generic here. <coughs> and we'll bring this in. And import it. Yeah, okay, so this, I thought there was somewhere else to do this. In, in the, all right, so I took this, by adding floor tiles here, right, here's what, you know, just that random, you know, generic stucco thing I brought in, great, fine. But if I add the floor tiles, um, that layer here, it generates, um, you know, it essentially overlays like a displacement map, or just checkerboard pattern here. It's offset because I rotated that. There we go. And so y you can see how you could do, you know, like Backpack was doing, and use other use textures instead of like I want to, you know, totally reproduce this thing and use it more as like a starting point for some other stuff. Um, and so, in the floor tiles, this looks like the same. Th this tiling effect exists in Painter as well, and it's pretty fully featured. And if you come down here under pattern, 
there's a bunch of other stuff under different types of patterns. Um, yeah, so there's even what you were talking about, more of a random one, the um, triangle tiles, or what, what, how did I just get to that? Um, yeah, there we go. All right, so that gives you more. If you want to turn this into more of like a uh, stone walkway kind of thing, right? And then so there's tile amount right here. This is not tiling the texture. It's just increasing the density of this tile overlay thing that's, that's generating this stuff over top. Brush rock wrap. I don't know. What does that look like with something else? Okay, so these change depending on, yeah. So you can choose different patterns and then you can change here. There's some different parameters depending on which one that you're accessing. And then gap, right? So gap color and gap width, right? If you turn up the width, right now we can start to get something that looks more like believable as like, uh, you know, like kitchen floor, apartment tile kind of thing. Um, and then uh, this is not going to use displacement, so turning that off here to get a better use, right? This is not something where you want to use displacement, um, right? So gap metallic. Right, whether or not the part in between should have metallic parameters there. Bevel profile, right? So all the stuff in all of these layers, they've, in substance sampler, for whatever reason, they've tried to err on the side of simplicity and that it shows you like the simplest stuff at the top. But then if you scroll down, each of these things that you unfold, we haven't even gotten to whatever the advanced parameters are. Let's look, normal intensity. Right, so this is kind of like the offset, you know, like how deep is the grout and what's going on here. Like scale, this seems weird as an advanced parameter, but regardless. Rotate random. How crappy was the tiling job? Dirt. Yeah, so you got some different options there with that. The one in Painter is even deeper. Uh, I'm going to go into...
my hose knitting. Where did I get to that before? Okay, yeah, it's a texture. That's what I was going on. Okay, so for instance, it's all running together. It's not a generator or a filter, it is a texture. And so I'm gonna put this texture on the height channel of this thing. All right, so height, and now I'll put the tile generator on height, and give it a second, and it does that. Uh, close that. Okay, so now um, this is pretty deep. Um, there's a ton of different patterns here. Um, the attributes of this, if we. Going to tiles a bit more. There we go. Got it, guess. All right, so it's on the height channel, right? So again, it's a it's a texture, so you can put it on any any channel you want, but I put it on the height here. And if we get back to that. Um what is the shortcut to make this full screen? I'll have to look that up, what it is here. But anyways, there's um this thing is really deep. There's a bunch of different patterns here and then the patterns themselves right so sort of like a we do like a rivet or like an indent kind of thing here and the um, you, they could be scaled this is sort of the tiling within that pattern uh, transformation right so if you wanted to offset them Let's do something that's not circular. Right, and some of these parameters change depending on which one you're dialing up here. But you see with this one, I mean, you get to a lot of different things here using this. I mean, and then this could be, you know, again, if you just drag over a layer back over here, you can turn it into its own, um, you know, you can sort of, you can do SBSAR, you know, formation here as well, because, you know, it's just kind of like a preset of a layer at that point in Painter. But yeah, so there's more tiling there in Sampler. And then again, it's a, um, It is a texture here, so come in here and search for a tile. Here it is. Tile generator is going to be this pretty fully featured tile thing. Big question marks. Celeste. Hi. So in sampler. Um, the color variation, adding another color, doesn't seem to be working. 
Also, this black box keeps showing up, and I don't know why. So, just wondering why the extra colors isn't aren't aren't working. That's it. I think that has Thanks. to do with the with the input. Let's see here if this works. So again, color variation. Uh, let's make it something obvious. And then if we added another color, the the input to this one Yeah, so the way it triggers those colors is based on the input into that, right? So things are evaluating in this direction. And so the top level of it here, color selection mode automatic, what is this? If we switch to manual. I don't see what's changing there at all. I mean, the colors change, obviously, but does that mean that we can move the order? No. I'm not entirely sure. Anyways, it's like the contrast of the underlying thing that's driving these colors here. And so the equalize, you see that as I change the value here on this, it'll it sort of changes how the color valuation, color variation evaluates. And so this, I think, is the quickest way to access that by changing, putting an equalize below the color variation to change that. Fabio. Hello, everyone. This is Fabio Brazzesi here. Um, I finally caught up with all my assignments. Yay. I have a, a day off tomorrow after all these days working in assignments. Yeah. So my question this week is related to the Substance uh, Sampler. Uh, on this pattern, uh, the sidewalk uh, pattern, I had a hard time to, to get the same result that you had on your example here um, on this, with these colors and everything like that it was very um, natural. So <clears throat> on mine, I put a color uh, variation and I put like three colors to blend and 
I like the way that it ended up, but I would like to have something close to yours. I, I don't know. So the big thing here is that I changed the base material to brick, and that's going to make it way less shiny. Off what you did to the picture that make it so natural and, um, and the colors, they were so uh, vibrant. So um, if you see mine, um, mine ended up like this. It's a little washed out, and I don't know where I, what to do to uh, bring the color up. Did you do that on, um, on Photoshop or something? So there's two. The the color is getting washed out. Yeah. So that's happening. They're, they're kind of getting washed out on purpose by this. And you're going to get the best results with diffuse, even diffuse lighting, right? Because uh, we want the shadows to be caused by whatever is where we're rendering, right? Not have these shadows baked in to the texture because of whatever direction the light was originally. I can get Substance Sampler to open this other material. I'm going to close Photoshop. Cool. All right. So here, um, and yeah, the, the again, this is designed for you know designing materials, and so th it is you know doing what we talked about, where it's trying to make sure that it, there's no shadows baked into the image, and that primarily is happening here, right? This is part of the AI part of this thing is that uh, it's trying to delight the image, right? And so um, I found by, by default, this is totally maxed out, saying like, get rid of my shadows, which in a lot of images are is really turning down the contrast, right? Because it wasn't particular, I didn't have any hard light shadows. The shadowing in this image that I took it is mostly coming from like the ambient occlusion uh, that happens in the little, where the mason, where the mortar is uh, in between the bricks, right? Um, and so there's two parameters here. There's, this is, by default, this is turned up the whole way, the delighting, which definitely does like wash it out. But again, like that, it's not, um, that's probably okay. Again, a lot of this depends on the lighting in the final scene that you're using, right? Um, so keep that in mind. But this is the um, this delighting intensity tends to wash things out, and then there's this ambient occlusion occlusion strength, and so it's trying to artificially add ambient occlusion. But you know, in this image here, I already had the ambient occlusion, you know, when I took it, and so I turned this. I think I used it in the example I posted. I think I had it like this, like yeah, don't add any more ambient occlusion and don't try to delight the image because there's no, I didn't need you to get rid of some existing shadows that were happening here. And then, um, so th keep that in mind. This is turned up by default, which makes things look pretty washed out. And in terms of returning intensity to it, there is a vibrance, right? Which is like saturation, but doesn't look terrible usually, right? And so that, turns up the you know vibrance of the image let's see if we can see a difference here All right so yeah like the blue hues are a little more
pronounced in this instance. If you just sort of crank the saturation, I don't know, not greater than this one. But that does bring some of this back. Let's do the other one. So yeah, that's that's one to be aware. That's one of the artificial intelligence things that's happening in that first step is that it does do this delighting step. And so let's look at this one here. It may be more obvious. So if we come down here, uh, if I turn down the delighting, right? So here, let's do it totally unprocessed is this, okay? No, don't add any in occlusion and don't try to delight the image. And that gives me that, All right? Now, yeah, I think that versus this, part of the situation here is that um, the ambient occlusion, we know what it is, but it can happen at several different points in a workflow, right? Here, the ambient occlusion we're talking about is going to be baked into the image, right? Because ambient occlusion is the darkening that happens when two things get close to each other. And so that doesn't really change depending on the lighting conditions. It, it would still be dark there, right? Unless you're like blasting a bunch of light like right into that nook or cranny. Um, and so it, the other thing to consider here is that you can uh, also add ambient occlusion at the end of your render, right? During the final render stage, um, which may or may not take it advantage of this. But that is way slower than having it baked in to the texture, right? Because then it doesn't need to calculate anything. It's already there in the pixels. All it's doing is just reading the pixels. And so this ambient occlusion off, delighting off, this, you know, this is still the one that I um, fixed with the um, tiling. But you can see that's what I get. And then if I, this is the default, you know, which does look kind of washed out here based on the, the settings. But as I turn the light around, you can see how that affects, you know, like it does change what's going on there. If I turn that down, it's very subtle, right? I mean, it would depend a lot on what you want in your final look. But this tells it to add more ambient occlusion. You can tell that that gets a little, a little much there, right? As far as like how dark those little nooks and crannies in between the rocks are, right? There's nothing. There's more ambient occlusion. It starts to look like too much of a Photoshop filter, you know, and that's without it there, right? I mean, this, you know, this is here to make up for maybe, you know, images that were not taken that well. I mean, if you're making a high quality texture, you want to have, you know, the, the diffuse lighting. Like that's going to be the most successful workflow. And then in terms of, uh, you know, if I turn this up the whole way and kind of wash it out, then again, you can come back here and bring some of that color that, you know, because the delighting is trying to, you know, make it, you know, really flat in general. And then here, we can really see what goes on with the vibrance, right? That's no, and then, you know, just a more subtle, here it is with just saturation, it tends to look, yeah, not that great that turns up the intensity that brings some of that color back to it that's kind of at odds with the with the delighting stage so again those parameters are in the image to material right there's a lot happening there in the image to material and right here right so ambient occlusion strength and uh, delighting intensity Marvin. Hello, Professor. Oh, oh, and then the other thing, Fabio, was that your, on your one, you still had, you know, the regular base material. Again, these are just sort of like presets for like what, where am I going here, just generally? And so like there's brick, concrete, fabric, right? I mean, this is sort of the default shininess of it. And probably this is going to be something less shiny 
as a starting point there with those values, right? Because you can see th these work exactly as they do in Redshift and Painter, right? We have roughness values. Let me move the light. In metallic values. Right, so experimentation there. If you want to turn this into something different, like this might be cool, but maybe not with so much height stuff. So, Oh yeah, if I turn the detailing down, I think it makes it flat, right here. Right, so now, more like, you know, like a metallic wallpaper kind of thing. Um, if oh, I've clicked too many things, hold on. Okay, it's just slow to respond here. So let me see. Yeah, so it, I mean, the magic here is that, you know, we take this two-dimensional picture and then it does this 3D stuff with it, right, to sort of pull it out. And, yeah, this is like, uh, technically I'm not totally sure, but it's affecting that process of, like, what's happening when we make this thing three-dimensional. And so if you want to look at the individual channels down here, you can sort of see how it's affecting the ones that affect how it pulls out, right? So you can see it, it changes the effect on the height channel and the effect on the normal channel. Right, so if I dial it the whole way down, we can get to something that's very, you know, flat and then sort of turn down the details. Now we're just, essentially we just took our picture and slapped it on the geometry, right? There's no none of that other magic happening there with the, right, that's with the details down and the geometry equalizer at, at zero, right? So it's, it's kind of, you know, how much is it gonna be pulled out of the system there? And then these three are kind of like, um, allow you to adjust the individual parameters within some sort of size. The large details one, yeah, so large details here correlates most closely to the size of the rocks given this texture. Right, and again, it looks metallic because down here in the base material, I cranked up the metallic slider, right? That's probably, if you want it to look like rocks, it's probably not cranked up, right? And so, but the roughness here. I had pinned a bunch of them just for curiosity when I brought it over. I brought it over into the subject screen. And of course, now when it exports it, it exports like 16 different modes that you can, you can use to create a redshift material or a, or, or a noble material. It, it exports those back out. So if you pin them here and it sends over the subject screen, yeah, you, you should get those as sliders, yeah. Yeah. But they're kind of, I don't know if 
very useful. Like I, I don't know. How you, you, you would only want to pin things that I would use. You, you would use. You, well, yeah, you, you don't even need to pin height. Like that's already a slider in Painter, right? Like you can dial up and down the height. Like the um, and those pins are most useful, probably in ones where you're at where, where you used more of the generator stuff here like the atlas right like the the because then like that's that's one that's definitely not going to be able to be adjusted over there right like the, the that pinning idea is most useful right if we put the leaves on here um atlas scatter and then we grab one of those wherever they are Oh yeah, in here. Um. All right, so there. Put the leaves on there. Right, so th this, the scatter parameters here, x amount and y amount, those would definitely be useful to pin, right, because those would not be readily available over there, right? And those sort of, you know, I'll call them meta parameters, right? Not like the base level stuff, like height, like how strong is the height channel, how strong is the normal channel. Ideally, you want this, I would err on the side of these being too contrasty because you can always step on it later right it's it's like resolution right should you pay, take a picture with more resolution or less resolution well just take it with more resolution right because you can always crop it or reduce the resolution later you can't really do the other thing right where if we take a really crappy picture that's like 100 pixels across we can't turn that into an hd image really right i mean there's like tricks but they don't work like capturing a high like you can always reduce the amount of information easily, right? But as far as like recreating information that's missing, you know, that for the most part is not available, right? It's like clipping in recording music, right? You know, if it's clipping, that information is gone. It's not in the waveform, right? You can't bring it back. Um, same idea. Go. Cool. Is that everybody? Carmen is here. Where's your Zeus? He was here last week, I think. Yeah, so there's the Atlas Scatter. And
So yeah, this is what I was thinking about in terms of, right, the, the, it makes sense in terms of like leaves and rocks and stuff like that, but in terms of more like abstract pattern creation, if we did something, well, that may be too splattery, let's see. Well, let me do it with something simpler first. Let's see here, rather than having a whole bunch of splatters. OK, so if we brought this in, we'll export this as a PNG. And then came back over here. Uh, so let me get rid of Atlas Scatter. I have Atlas Creator here. Uh, in Atlas Creator, I think this is what we're looking for to load an image. Um, let me turn that off for a second. Okay, that's doing what we want somewhat in that we've got the atlas scatter is scattering this atlas, but it is not grabbing this. Let's check out, I've been pleasantly surprised with the documentation, which is why I linked to it. It's something about the way this image that we put in there
So this one does have a list of every filter. Okay, so counterintuitively, um, it doesn't want transparency. So, it's just white, and we'll explore it again. look at that. Okay, so generate an atlas material from an image. Import your source into the layer stack. So I'm going to bring this in. The stuff I, you know, it's all white around whatever the different things I want to have there. Cool. It brings those in. Now it tries to do all this height stuff like we talked about, which could be neat, but we're going to ignore it. We don't want that in this instance. And so, because I'm talking more about generating like a, like a pattern. And so... We're just turning off the geometry stuff there. Okay, makes sense. Now, um, Atlas Creator to the top of the stack. Ah, excellent. You can see that it's correctly cut everything out because it's not expecting a PNG with an alpha channel, unlike every other program. Uh, it's expecting just white. So, I mean, I guess that makes sense. It's assuming a workflow where we took a whole bunch of leaves, dumped them on the table, and took a picture of them, right? And in that instance, it's saving us the work of going in and deleting the table, right? So, cool. Um, at this creator. Cool. All right, so now this makes it an atlas and so now if we wanted to dynamically arrange this thing if we put the scatter at the top I think we just dump this in here nope
think we need to export this first. So no scatter, just that. Let's make it an SPSAR. Now, in here, we need to add our SBSAR, right? So this would be an inst you know, instance where you can use um, I mean, you're kind of an atlas is an, uh, an SBSAR, and so you're kind of using one in another. And so if we drag this in here, can't drag it in there. What if we just do this? for a whole folder, I think. There it is. Great. So now Now we should be able to use it. Let's see. Right, so that was making the atlas, which is essentially dragging in the image with the white background, letting it do its thing. If you want to make sure that it's flat, like it would be for a pattern, then just turning down the geometry in the details so that it's, so that it's just flat. Uh, and then adding the Atlas Creator at the top, which once you do that, it knocks out the, the background. Now, this one, our new material. Can I just make a blank material? This one, okay, cool. Um, this blank material, we will add and scatter. There we go. And we should be able to dump our thing into the scatter. Cross your fingers. Ta da! It worked! Sweet! Okay, so now, yeah, it's not, you know, it's randomly arranging these on the surface here. Um, and so now you go into Atlas Scatter and you can change all this stuff as far as like how many copies there are, uh, the scale of those, right? And so now we can really get into some, some interesting stuff. Do you want to randomize the scale? No scale overlap. Yeah, so this is pretty cool, right? We don't want any of them to overlap. Um, there's two ways to do this kind of thing. One is to like figure out the shape of everything and then move stuff so that it doesn't overlap. That's in general tough. No scale overlap just means like it's gonna try and like scale things until they don't overlap. It kind of does the work there. Anyways, but now, so you have X mount, Y mount, position random, right? So randomized versus lined up, right? So now it's like putting them in a line. That one, that one, that one now. We're still randomizing the scale somewhere down here, size, scale random. 
ah, there we have a totally repeating pattern now, right? So, or they don't change. It's all it's it's just like a cloner, just like a cloner, right? How much do does each one line up with the rotation of each one? They're still the exact same, but they're being randomly rotated, which is the default. And so we say random rotation, no. There we go. Right, and so now it's randomly selecting them from the atlas and essentially putting them on a grid, you know, because we didn't do anything to the random um, position. Yeah, I mean, it just you, you just don't want it to do all the stuff that that image to AI does. So, so you, you just pick the other option there, right? But yeah, the image to AI, the image to AI is pre-assuming the workflow of like you know of rocks. I took a picture of these rocks, and I want to turn these rocks into a thing, right? And whereas like something like the lace is more um, additive, where like I'm gonna design something based on several layers. And so, you know, th that bringing it in is, that just gives it one, it's not gonna try to generate a bunch of other junk, it's just going to be there as a separate layer. Okay. Right, so there's different ways to use the program in that way. Like, mostly it seems to be designed with the idea that like, I took a picture of it and now I want it as a material, right? So that kind of fast tracks that workflow. But you can also make more co complicated things from like an additive standpoint, you know, more like layering stuff in Photoshop where yeah, that's like the lace, like where it's gonna be multi, because he uses two images there and then layers them on top of each other, yeah. you know. So, but this this works for creating all sorts of, so this would be more of what I was thinking about with the graffiti stuff where, you know, if you like that one pattern, if you just made an atlas like that, um, Yeah. I didn't get to that one because of the edge tiling thing was going to be. Oh, yeah. Uh, you probably don't want it. Um, here, I'll fix it. And they came over to Procreate, so there's an event there. Ah, there it goes. I don't know how this is gonna work. We'll see because the edges are pretty undefined, but we'll see how it works. Um, cool, so I've got this file. Export SPNG. Again, need to have the white background. This is a paint splatter test. Now, do it again. Uh, back in here, uh, I just make a new material again, and I bring in paint splatter test because this needs to become an atlas, right? So in this case, yeah, not this, that, and let's do it. 
thing. We don't want any of this pipe business happening, so I'm just getting rid of that stuff. Cool. And yeah, turning down the ambient occlusion and the D lighting also give us better results there. And then, in order to turn this into that specific kind of material, an atlas, we need to add the atlas creator to the top of the stack. And if you do it, you see that it does remove. Now in this case, I think there's a slider here. Yeah, we can see how much of the splatter that we want. Yeah, so if you turn down remove small shapes, you get more of the Spider. I don't know how that's going to work later on. We'll see. Uh, good. Now I export this as an SBSAR to that folder I made because it's got to look in a folder and call this paint splatter test. Um, that should show up here. I was still doing it. Uh, maybe it's going to crash on this. Nope. There it is, showing up. Interesting. All right, let's see what happens. So now, uh, come back to this one. We'll use that same, the same one again. And instead of using that other test pattern, we'll just go to the paint splatter. Oh, can you put multiple atlases in one scatter? Mm, no, I don't think so. That guy's another really small. Yeah, so this also does this additional height thing there. Turn that off if you just want it to be a flat pattern. Oh, okay, I see what's going on here. So yeah, this, um, you definitely want them to be kind of continuous because it's kind of turning the um, edges of the splatter into separate shapes in the atlas. That's why those tiny little ones happen right there. So it's a little bit different. But we're onto something here, right? So you, know, you keep, like um, for making things like paisley patterns, things like that, if you just had one paisley and you brought it in. Oh, this turned out kind of wild. That's the other one there. Does this take two? It must, otherwise I don't think it would let you drag two of them in there, but who knows. Right, so in that example that you were talking about,
Right. Like my atlas would just be like one of those things against like a white background, right? And then, you know, you could use this whole system for scattering those into an SVSAR file different places. Right. I mean, depending on how bespoke some of this other stuff would be, like, like probably, you know, some of this stuff, you just sort of paint that part in Painter, you know? But, like, if you, this was going to be a repeated thing, like, again, you can make an atlas of, like, that and that and, you know, one of these. And then, you know, that, then you could, you know, arrange those over the surface of everything. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's another good atlas. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Oh, uh, I would like to do like kind of kickbashing looking, looking stuff like nuts and bolts that are on an atlas. Like just have an atlas of nuts and bolts. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. Totally add them to anything. You can add. So you can add to their community, I guess. Like create stuff and add to it. You know, like get a good one each. Um. Yeah. I th yeah, the substance share. Yeah, where's um. I mean, it is in Painter. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's in sampler in the same way. I don't know. I don't think there's a way to leave comments on those, so you're fine. No one's going to be too upset. Cool. All right, so yeah, we'll make um, some patterns. So th this is essentially what's going on with the, well, the lace, they're not using it as an atlas, they're using it yeah, as a no. thing. Yeah, let's look at that. Okay, let me turn this off first. I don't even know where to find it. I see the, I'm on the viewport. Okay. Well, here, let's, so you drug it in, and what, what does it do? Is it just not do it? Or it just crashes. Oh, it crashes. So completely, pretty much completely crashes colors. colors. Colors, and it is only this, and it works, right? So from from the images I downloaded, from no, the images I downloaded, what would it be? Uh, I have to go back to the lower image, but this, no, there, and then I have his, where he says to download the file. Yeah. Did you take it? Did you just take these two bits? Yeah. Yeah. I should have brought it up before. And so he said, start with this, start with the base structure, so I can go here and close the, and then close this without, because you have to go to new project, right? Okay, so, so, so according to tutorial,
It was a, mm -hmm. I thought it was an assist when I see the four. Yeah, when you uh, give the files, There's no, there's no, um, yeah, if I were to still. That's the one thing on Mac, you can just double click on the zip file, and it zips. It's just so much more convenient. I, I just don't, also, you know, on the reports. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, the, the. Can you just show me where in the world is it? Because I'm there, and I'm not in time to stand in. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Slightly bluer, which I which I'm okay with, but it's very artificial. I'm okay with that too. It's artificial. Did you see the Lex coffee thing? Did you see that? It's not coffee, it's like oh yeah, did you slow down? Yeah. Did you? No. no. <laughs> I, I listened to the Rick Rubin one over the weekend. Oh, I love that one. Did yeah. you? You don't have on any artists, mm -hmm. and I'm not looking to be on the show. I mean, I'm looking for just really great artists to be on the show. Yeah. But you know, I just want you know to tell them that when they leave this whole part of the world and listen. Yeah, because I really believe that. But the Rick Rubin on um, Joe Rogan in New York, I forgot who he was. But this guy who I remember his name. I mean, yeah, I mean, Lex, and then Lex had on this this uh, young comedian <laughs> had on this young woman. I don't remember her name. She was doing kind of a, a pop, and I, and it was because oh, it's she had a clip in it. They sent it. Oh, she had on. Um, she had on the Elon Musk girlfriend. That's the, that's, oh, that's uh, the extent of. Um, yes. So you know he interviewed her and I couldn't. That was unlistenable. <laughs> I find any time he has a woman on. Trying too hard. 
Is this what I'm supposed to do? Yeah. Now, that, now that I can be more constrained to act, uh. and I'm not actually doing that. Yeah, now you're right. So now I'm just going to go back. Yeah, to me. Not now. Just so that I can act. Oh, no, no. Well. I'll back to work just so that I can act. Uh. And yeah, just click the update. And Now that you're in, you're in, right? So all you have to do is launch the GeForce app, and then it'll talk to you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think it's anyone faster. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to order the Blizzard book from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is just what you know, a bunch of questions about users. So we got out of the way, and we're able to talk for the first time. Yeah, that was good. I don't know. Because I don't really need to hear um, to read the um, mm -hmm. invaders. I don't really need to hear you talk about the JJ and all that. Like, but I don't really talk about school, but I'm kind of with it. <laughs> but but I but I, I love the book. Thank you for the book about the Twitch party. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, this is really good. Yeah. I know it might be basic for you because it is about music theory. I mean, I know music theory, but I don't. No, no. no he has his two brothers, Eric. He has two brothers. I think it's just maybe Eric. Oh, oh, um, yeah. They're just they're, they're not super important. Um, Eric and who was the other kid? Yeah, they have one. Yeah. I think what the, some of my favorite ones are like um, Alex Lex, you know, who was part of the. There's so many. Some of the core elements I love. They, I don't know the people that well, but I love the the core hour to talk about it because obviously the it's a lot of the game a lot of the game topic is done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the, yeah, that was the thing. And I'll, I'll kind of try to li like the guys that talk about Python. I'll listen to it, but I'm not going to get a whole lot of it. But I'll listen to the tips, the things I take away one thing because you know that's what makes me want to. Coding, like whatever I can, whatever I can learn. Why not? The whole thing with the fabric, I'm really fascinated by it right now. I want to start doing some of that. I know Vmod has the digitizing service, but I started to create this shadow pattern for fear of not getting that fabric that was supposed to be for the show. Mm. And time to sell it, but not enough time to create it right now. I'm getting three color modes. They, they, uh, they have to go through a process after the silk screen. This is a shell fabric. Uh -huh. it's, it's called sublimation. That's supposed to give it like a baking of the color into the fabric so that it's not like a parka. But what did you send them? Oh, I didn't. I want their fabric. It's, it's the fabric that I wanted to use that kept the guy who was the paintball guy yeah. was wearing okay. that company line that had an opening. Where did and he get it? It's it's his company. Oh, okay. So it was it's being made in India. He has a paintball. And you can't just like order a shirt or something in India. You can order, yeah. I mean, you can order a jacket for like a hundred dollars. Oh. So I asked him for three yards uh -huh. of two colors, and I know how to break it. So you know, whatever comes out of my pocket. It wasn't anything like how I remembered it. Mm. I remembered it like a paintball style, mm. and it was more like a more like a V type, like honeycomb. Okay. But it really looks cool, and uh, I have like a wood round, what they call camouflage wood round, but in in that pattern and a blue and a gray, 
you don't have the physical fabric or the linen fabric. Right? Neither of those? Neither of them. Okay. But the one that I create would have been a paintball one. Mm -hmm. And I started doing that for this, for this assignment. Mm -hmm. It's in my it's in Google Drive where I started it. Mm -hmm. It's just just using a Procreate brush. So we, so for this show, we're gonna have three colorways strewn over in three different. Unfortunately, they can only be forty by fifty each, and it's only nine pieces. <laughs> we have to put it together to make the garment, to make three of these garments that I want to walk to the show. Not me walking to the show, but mm -hmm. them walking. And uh, plus two, plus two other parts of the frame of the garment of mine. But it wouldn't have had no for, for the animation. For next year, because like I said, it turned out to not be what I thought it would be. So I'd like to just digitize my own using you know, their sort of thing, substitute for them, to make my own fabric. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you got some stuff there. You can it's exactly what you just did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just yeah. sample her. You can just hit match and then you know, overlay the cartoon part of it. So then you would send it to a company that. To make a digital thing or to make like to make a real piece of fabric plus the digital. So you would have so the the idea which couldn't happen was the models are walking the real garment, this real cool garment from the fabric from the fabric that's that's I mean plus there would have been an animation of all of like twenty like a clone of models, faceless models walking the garment in all different. Lightweight shell that's really tough. And this is somewhere between Kevlar and. And then I've seen him wearing it. So his his line is called, um, I think it's Track Force. So it's partly supported by Veterans Against Child Trafficking. Mm -hmm. So the proceeds go to that. Like I'm just pulling a really cool paintball jacket. You can, you can wear them anywhere, but you can. Coming to your school yard, and they have to hang their hoodie on the gate. And when you come in, you see hundreds of hoodies because they want to be able to surveil the kids and not have them hide under it. And I thought that was really, really awful. Yeah.
Just want to have a certain kind of decorum, right? Don't distract anybody. 